Video games were already a billion dollar industry when the 80s ended, but they were still residing in untested waters. With the growing budgets and numbers of players, marketing became increasingly important to make a game a commercial success. The marketing machine started during the development process. It ranged from sending screenshots to the gaming press to making plans for an inventive marketing campaign. Magazines and trade shows were the most important outlets to show footage of upcoming games. CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, was the biggest trade show in the video game industry for the Western market. During its peak years, game companies reserved half the show floor, but floor space was quite expensive, easily costing a million dollars for a modest stand. But it was the opportunity to impress retailers. Getting retailers to order their products was the first step towards commercial success. But of course, press was also welcome to report the latest news and attract the interest of consumers. I'm here with Ellen Van Buskirk, and she's uh, very important with Sega America. What are you brought to CES this year? Well, we've got lots of stuff with CES. At Sega, we've got sports games for Genesis. We've got some great character-based games for Genesis. We've got a whole new lineup on Game Gear and Sega CD, the second generation of video games. We brought that out to the marketplace last year, and it's been a tremendous seller. Footage of upcoming software was either playable on early beta ROMs or pre-recorded on tape. With Konami's Castlevania 4, you can count on spellbinding sales. Shortly before the game's launch, the focus of the marketing shifted from retailer to consumer. Advertising agencies were hired to help in this process and come up with catchy material. Only a select few titles were assigned a marketing budget to afford TV commercials, as they could easily cost a million dollars. Magazine ads, on the other hand, were a more common way to reach gamers. Nintendo even created and published their own successful magazine as a direct line of communication with their consumers. On the downside, this also meant that Nintendo kept all juicy information for their Nintendo Power instead of sharing it with independent magazines. Although Nintendo games were still prominently featured in gaming literature, it proved to be an opportunity for Sega to get their games in the spotlight. They realized that getting their games on covers ultimately compared to having countless tiny billboards without actually paying a single dollar. Sega only had one-tenth of the marketing budget of Nintendo, so they were forced to find clever ways to get the most out of their marketing dollars. Marketing and sales departments also had a big influence in suggesting new games to develop, especially when it came to titles based on popular licensing properties. With the marketing engine running and the game code completed, it was time to manufacture the cartridge, box, and manual. This process could take a month and was fully controlled by the console manufacturer, as was the game's distribution to retailers. This led to some frustration for third-party developers. Not only were they forced to pay a higher price per cartridge, but the lack of control made the height of the order a big gamble. If the game didn't sell according to expectations, the losses of unsold copies were for the developer. While on the other hand, if the game sold exceedingly well, it could take a while before new copies were ready to hit store shelves. Distribution was not what it is now. Games were typically transported by container ships, taking weeks to a month to get from factory to stores. Street dates and global releases were unheard of, and games ended up in stores simply when they arrived. As a marketing stunt by Sega, Sonic 2 became the first game with a global launch date, dubbed Sonic Tuesday. Once a game finally hit stores, the battle continued. The amount of shell space, in-store displays, and brochures were important factors for commercial success. During the NES era, Nintendo had a firm grip on US retailers, as their products formed a substantial portion of the retailers' total revenue. This even resulted in fear of selling games of competing companies. Nintendo also acknowledged the importance of hiring a local Nintendo sales representative during holiday season. They were trained to not only answer questions, but also push products like cleaning kits and carrying cases, in addition to recommending their systems over the competitions. I really like that one game, though, and I know that it wouldn't work with this system. Yeah, but you gotta realize that one game doesn't make the system. You wanna look at the history of a product and see how many good games that come out for it over time. The final big factor that could lead to a purchase was the game's cover art. Typically, the work was outsourced to specialized illustrators, it's safe to say that most of them never actually managed to play the game before creating their art. They were sent reference material or gameplay footage recorded on VHS tapes as inspiration. If we take a closer look at the store shelves of the early 90s, Super Mario World, Mega Man, Sonic, and Maze of Gallius, they were all Japanese productions. How come so many video games were of Japanese origin? 
In the 80s, the Japanese economy was booming, and so was their video game market. While in the US, game companies were still licking their wounds from the local video game crash, Japanese companies were eager to enter this emerging market. As a result, most 8-bit video games were created in Japan. But not all developers were big enough to have an international publishing arm, and those that did have the resources were not necessarily eager to publish all of their games to their local market. They picked the games that they thought had the highest potential for return in investment. This meant that quite a few titles, especially shoot-em-ups and RPGs, were often left in Japan even when they were high-quality productions. When a game was picked for international launch, the first step was to translate the on-screen text. The quality of translations tended to vary. The infamous Zero Wing was translated by the Japanese sales manager of the company, who considered himself qualified for the job. And maybe he was right. An important factor in the translation process is the available memory, since English text requires more characters and thus more bytes than Japanese. So corners had to be cut in order to fit the game on the same type of cartridge. RPGs in particular had considerably less dialogue compared to the original Japanese release. The translators were not always familiar with the subtleties of the game, so occasionally important hints were lost in translation. But translating the on-screen text was just the most basic step. Games themselves were often tweaked to cater more to a specific market. Difficulty levels were adjusted, and various subjects that could be considered offensive were censored. But of course, the most famous example of the influence of localization is Super Mario Bros. 2. The original Japanese sequel was not considered suitable as a follow-up by Nintendo of America. They decided to retool the graphically more impressive Famicom game Doki Doki Panic into a Super Mario Bros. game, and with great success, as it was well received and also expanded the world of Super Mario with fresh and memorable characters. Now let's take a closer look at the business side. It's hard to find exact budget numbers, but the production costs of a typical early 16-bit game likely ranged from $100,000 to $300,000. In terms of sales numbers, selling 1 million copies was considered a huge hit in those days, so the break-even point was likely a lot lower. With the growing budgets of games, the fiscal year of a company and the holiday season became increasingly important. Leaders in the industry tended to bet on a couple of titles for most of their income. Each year it was a necessity to have a new hot release in stores before the holiday season. Of course, this added some pressure on development and led to some unfortunate decisions, like in the case of Fantasia, which was rushed to the market to quickly extend the Mega Drive's library in 1991. There were many players in the market, console manufacturers, publishers, and developers in all sizes. The smaller development houses were usually reliant on a publisher to release, fund, and market their game. ToeJam & Earl, for example, was made by a tiny company of just two people. They pitched their game to Sega, who were intrigued by the game's unique concept and believed in its potential. Sega's director of marketing, Al Nilsson, was always on the lookout for interesting projects that could turn out to be either a hit or flop. Thanks to his mindset, projects like Echo the Dolphin could flourish. There were also cases where a publisher would come up with an idea for a game and outsource production to the best suited developer. This could be the company with either the lowest bid or the best track record. However, in order for an independent third-party developer to release their game on a console, they had to sign a licensing deal and comply to a number of strict rules. These varied between the different manufacturers, with Nintendo being seen as the one with the strictest contracts. In addition to paying up to $10 in royalties for each game sold, they demanded a two-year exclusivity for any release and a maximum of five releases per year. This may sound unfair from a third-party developer's perspective, but they were still able to ride on the investments and success of the console manufacturers. These strict rules were also put in place to avoid flooding the market with poor quality games which could result in a crash of the entire industry. But when the market matured and Sega started to conquer more market share, Nintendo's grip faded and development houses gained more control. Acclaim, for example, knew they had enough leverage when porting Mortal Kombat to make a deal on their terms. As a result, Mortal Kombat was available on both Sega and Nintendo systems at launch. This paved the way for the multi-platform rollout that became the standard years later. So as we demonstrated, marketing and sales teams had a relatively big influence in what gamers were playing. Inside the companies, there was a healthy struggle between game developers and sales managers. Developers were fighting for more time, and sales managers usually wanted to release a game sooner rather than later. But when in balance, Together they could produce a great product that was both profitable and fun to play. And so we end the final chapter of this three-part series. Hopefully it gave you some insight into how these classic games were made and marketed, but there is more to tell. 
So stay tuned as we unravel more production secrets of gaming icons. Sonic 2 handles stubborn stains, embarrassing bald spots, no problem. It even slices and dices, makes thousands of julienne fries, and pets love it too. Pets love it too.